My name is Shubha Chadgar. For over a decade, I worked as a TV journalist for news affiliates around the country. Most recently, I could be seen daily on ABC News here in Los Angeles, reporting on everything from political elections to murder trials to award shows. Today, though, I'll be using my investigative background to deep dive into the world of artificial intelligence, specifically AI and healthcare. As we have seen recently, AI has been all over the news and not in a good light. There's been a sense of fear and uncertainty, specifically on the public's perception of what AI will do to their jobs, the stories they consume, and most of all, their livelihoods. But what if there was a way to use artificial intelligence for good? Over the last 15 years, Dr. Inderpal Randawa, founder and CEO of the Food Allergy Institute, has been a pioneer and champion for AI. He says he has created a groundbreaking artificial intelligence-based program that can help put an end to food allergies. Let's take a look. Dr. Randawa, tell me, what is AI? AI stands for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is essentially a process or a system that can mimic human intelligence. So it sounds very simple. And I think in so many ways people get worried about it, but it's been around for a very long time. Uh, literally since the 1500s, the concepts of artificial intelligence have been around. And these days it's mainly found in engineering, in computer science, and if you go back to the 1950s, the first type of artificial intelligence was back then, where they found a way to play chess and with a limited amount of logic, which is essentially the human brain being mimicked, it was able to produce the first AI that was there in computer science. But I think now AI has gotten a pretty bad rap. Why do you think that's the case? I think AI has a bad rap because it's just different, right? It's, it's set back. People don't totally understand it. They don't see its utility. I'd say it's very similar to any new technology. When we first got smartphones, people were a little hesitant on certain things, but they found the utility and then they rapidly adapted to it. AI is different because it's, it's a whole other level of complexity, right? It's really a, an absorption of many, many systems that operate so much faster than humans that it actually tends to scare people by that sheer speed and efficiency. So tell me about the tolerance induction program and how you and your researchers have used AI to kind of create this, this platform to, to learn how to treat patients efficiently. Yeah. So the tolerance induction program is very unique because it uses a sub segment of AI called machine learning. So machine learning is one part of AI. And the other one that I mentioned is called deep learning. In fact, that's what is popular with chat GPT and so forth. That's a segment over there. But we focused fully on machine learning for almost 18 years now, for a very long period of time. And remember, any form of AI has to learn based on databases, so large amounts of data. And so what I did many years ago when I started this program is first understand this disease of anaphylaxis. It's caused by a set of foods, a set of proteins. That's one database. And then it has a response, an immune response. That's another database. So I built two massive databases way back then that continue to gather data to this day. That is what our AI systems learn off of. And by utilizing AI to actually generate and run this data, we're able to take a single patient who's anaphylactic, say, to five or six foods, understand how their system will respond to treatment and actually predict when their system will respond to treatment to a point of remission. That's, again, unheard of in modern medicine. But without AI, we certainly wouldn't have gotten to this point. But I think that I think now AI is so scary. I mean, yeah. you hear the term and people are thinking, you know, robots that are going to pretend like they're humans and uh, college essays are going to be written by a computer. And it, it is a very scary reality. Yeah. How do you kind of tell patients out there that this technology is being used for good? Yeah. I mean, I would say that um, there are really early types of AI, right? I mean, if you look at uh, what is occurring with ChatGPT as an example, you're looking at a system that is only trying to forecast words, right? It's, it's, it's doing that work to forecast words. If you go back to 2012, there's a very large program that occurred called AlexNet that was there to program and look at what pixels would do. So it would say, hey, if I want to create a picture, if I want to read a picture, it will produce X, Y, or Z. 
believe it or not, those are very simple things to do, right? It's just, again, AI. It's learning how to create the next forecasted word or the next forecasted picture. What we're doing is using individual steps of machine learning and AI to take a patient's TIP program or tolerance induction program through a series of steps. And keep in mind, none of these steps are independent of a human operator. We have physicians and scientists who run every step of this. It is never going from point A to point Z without literally hundreds of human interventions in that process. That is why we have great success. We are safe, we are secure, and we have you know, excellent rates of remission. So I would then flip it back to what the rest of the world of AI is doing. They're doing this without much regulation. They're not doing it with much consent. And they're doing it in a way where they're hoping they can get a rapid result. I personally don't believe that will happen. I believe that that will take much, much more time. Our approach, our type of system is the is the model for the future of AI. Which which program are you talking about there where you're saying they're doing that? I'll give you I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> back in the 1990s, IBM created something called Watson. Uh, we're a well-known program. It was a, essentially a robot, but really it's a form of AI. It was amazing. It could beat the top champions at Jeopardy. It could beat the top world chess champion. Interestingly, that single form of AI could, could really be efficient. But remember, AI only operates based on what it was trained upon. If you actually took that same Watson now and put it up against the world chess champion, it would lose because it is not trained above what these humans have now trained above. Mm -hmm. So it shows you the faults that are there. And I'd like to give a specific example to healthcare. In 2010, Watson was deployed in hospital settings. It was deployed across uh, several major cancer centers in the United States. Why? Because they thought by simply feeding Watson information about cancer treatment programs that it would come up with the best treatment option. Well, it didn't work. It failed at Sloan Kettering and it failed at MD Anderson. And just last year, the entire portfolio of Watson actually wound up and it doesn't exist anymore. So the way you build AI, the way you test AI, and the way you actually deploy it requires an incredible amount of seriousness, a uh, level of gravitas that's really necessary. Otherwise, frankly, I just don't see people being in the space very long. This is something that I always was wondering, because, you know, there's so many different food allergy treatment programs now, uh, especially now. I mean, I back in the day, you were probably the lone wolf out there, but now there's a lot of them. So how is what you're doing now and how is AI being used in what um, the Food Allergy Institute is doing compared to other programs? Is there a comparison? Are they also using the same type of technology? So the tolerance reduction program is the only medical program or medical treatment program in any disease space in the world that actually uses AI to induce remission. That's all. There's literally no one else out there. Uh, in fact, we just had a major publication out uh, just a few months ago that really shed light on this. The fact that we are such a unique form of AI. Currently in healthcare, AI is only used, and I'm talking a very small percentage of, of healthcare even utilizes AI. It's utilized to read x-rays. It's utilized to read uh, pathology slides like tissue reports and things of this nature. It is not utilized to actually say, maybe you should go treat the patient this way. So we have built a robust system that completely separates us from everyone else in medicine, uh, for, let alone in the, in the space of food allergy. We are absolutely unique in what we do. And I believe, frankly, it was done right from the beginning, right? It, our ability to build the infrastructure to use AI and to build upon AI, it puts us way ahead of everyone else. I really wish the rest of healthcare would look at us as a model and start to go towards other diseases in the same way. I, many people are afraid of AI, you know, kind of causing computers and robots to go rogue. Yep. <laughs> Is there a way to curb that from happening in, in your organization where, you know, you've got all of this data, people's medical information, highly sensitive information, and potentially incorrect diagnoses. I mean, we, we don't know maybe the agenda of, of, of AI software sometimes. Um, is that a fear and how do you kind of protect against that? Yeah, absolutely right. I think the, again, the, the goal is to not take major jumps when you're developing in the world of, of artificial intelligence. We've seen this go the wrong way, right? We've seen this 
where if you use too much artificial intelligence, it can cause airplanes to not fly right. We've seen, we've used too much artificial intelligence, defense systems fail. So it's to me, AI is run best when it is worked and built along human operators. It is there to make humans much better at what they do. But to your point, which is an absolutely valid point, how can we stop the AI from making the wrong diagnosis? And for there, we have what are called decision points. So if you take a patient who joins our program, the first thing they do is they come in and data comes in through their actual input. So the patient's families are entering in information. We know that's actually working correctly because it's then validated up on a secondary and tertiary steps. So these kind of safety nets are built in on every step of data. So again, if the data is clean. We know it's going to work well for us. On the critical steps, which is, are we going to give the patient the right amount of proteins at the right time and those frequencies? Those are all done under human operators where the machine learning systems don't are not actually built to make a decision. They're built to essentially give a recommendation. And since they cannot actually hit the switch and say go, it's up to the human operator who we know we've trained and we trust that they will make the right decision. Has that happened though? Where let's say there is a recommendation mm -hmm. and an operator, a human, will mm -hmm. take that information, give a, a patient kind of a dosage, patient goes home, takes that dosage, and it's just wrong. Yeah. And they, I don't know the worst case scenario, anaphylaxis. Has that happened yeah. here? It has not happened. We've been actually extremely good at utilizing our big data systems to always take all of risk into, into compliance. So what's beautiful about our system is it has so many repeated safety nets that are available that even if one person was to try to make a decision, it would alarm or set a red flag and say, no, that's not a proper way to move forward. So if you look at what we do on a weekly basis, you're looking at somewhere around 100 million doses of food protein being given to our patients per week around the world. And our, our incident report of an actual error rate so far has been zero. So an alarm is within the within the technology, or is that like an actual person saying no, kind of double checking their work? Both. Okay. Uh, so it's great. It's in the system and it actually feeds into the next system without going into an immense amount of details. Remember that the AI and the software systems interact with the rest of the users. So those users actually have different systems themselves. So by actually having a red flag up, when they go interact with the next user, the user knows something's wrong. Tell me a little bit about the proprietary software that you guys have created within within the organization. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we would not be able to do what we do if we did not think about this disease and the tolerance induction program very differently. To me, it all came down to data, right? We had to have these large databases and then we had to make sure that these databases are operated around with AI, machine learning, but then we, we had to make sure that the user interfaces would actually interact with four key players. One was obviously, first and foremost, the patients. So the patients had to have information and that is currently available on a patient app that is going into, into live mode here for all of our patients in the next number of months. The second group, which is critical, is our clinical providers. They need to know that what they are doing for their patients on every challenge and every start, every launch is going to be accurate and move forward. So that's another separate user interface. The third user interface is our research scientists and essentially our, our machine learning folks, making sure that they can study what's going on in the system at any given time to make sure it's operating well and effectively. And then the fourth group, which is also the critical group, is actual our software developers so that they can make sure that the system in total is operating at maximum efficiency. So all those different faces are essentially what surround our electronic medical record system, which is fully proprietary. It's been built for from the ground up and is again, very unique because you will not find any form of such a system focused on one disease. This is purely focused on food allergies, start to finish. And in your words and in, 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 in your thought process, this AI is being used for good, right? Absolutely. 8,000 yep. patients in remission. Yep. Tell me about kind of reaching that goal because that is a lot. That's a lot. If you think about any disease, how many you know, hospitals, systems, universities can say they have achieved X number of patients with one disease. 8,000 patients with one disease puts us on the map locally, nationally, and globally. And if you look at it from an AI standpoint, we've only been doing this work for about 20 years, right? For over a hundred years, the disease has existed with no solution. 
We've provided the maximum solution in 20 years. That's because AI allows us to operate at such a high factor greater than what humans can do. And so we should not fear that. You know, we should make sure we look at that and say, what is the maximum benefit? The maximum benefit for these kids is they reach food freedom. They can eat whatever they want, whatever they want, without any restriction. So what is right now, because this obviously is a little bit of an uncharted territory, food allergies, we've been discovering a lot. What what is the biggest challenge in healthcare right now? I think the biggest challenge in healthcare with AI is the FDA needs to de determine how they want to utilize pure AI systems in actual patient diagnosis or patient treatment. And right now we are in that process working with the FDA, but I will tell you, we are pretty much their first you know, attempt at this. And it's been a it's been a slow and go process, but we're very optimistic that we're going to get there. But the federal government, including the FDA, has to determine when they want to come in and start to regulate this system. I believe every major tech company out there is in agreement that we need some degree of regulation on AI. I have not seen anyone who says that's a bad idea. The question is, we need the right people with the right background to go in there and, and make those decisions. But you say AI and that term in itself is just it's terrifying to people. How do you approach that? How do you convince the FDA, the government, that this is for good? So our experience so far dealing with the regulatory side of what AI likely will be is it is built around a lot of structure for safety and for transparency. It's really that simple. No different than how we would ever take a pharmaceutical drug to market, right? There has to be safety and there has to be efficacy around what you're doing and you have to show that in some form of clinical trials and such. Because we have so many patients, it's actually been very easy for us to just open that book up and show it to the FDA as an example. But really greater than that is they should look at the safety that's built into the system, really into the machine learning, into the software systems and show them and show everyone that you can build a system that is ultimately prioritizing safety above everything else. And again, AI doesn't have to you know, stoke fear or induce fear. It should actually, if it's done right, give people a lot of confidence that the information that's being processed by these systems and being operated by humans is only going to make us incredibly better and only make us effective at what we do. But it is hard for me to believe that there haven't been mistakes along the way. Have there been mistakes? I would say our mistakes, frankly, are in the build of AI itself. But the beauty of AI, if it's built properly, is you don't deploy the AI until it's ready. So what we've done since day one, and I will just kind of go through those you know, steps, starting back in 2005, uh, this was a lot of applied math, right? So this is really just looking at the mathematical relationships of data versus data. Once we had the mathematical relationships organized, we can then say, let's create some algorithms. And then we had some algorithms to help make some decisions. Those have to constantly be studied. At that stage, that is technically AI, right? Now, did we make mistakes getting there? We've had, you know, occasional hiccups here or there, but honestly, nothing of any significant concern. I think for all the years we've been doing this work, that would have been, you know, exposed at this stage. But the wonderful thing is once we had our data system set, once we committed to a really clear vision of what we wanted our AI to do, we were then able to really ramp up take on many, many more patients. This is going to 2011 and 2012 now. Volume of patients was able to go up. Once we were able to reach 3,000, 5,000 patients, the amount of data behind those patients is absolutely immense. So as you see that, you deploy newer training systems for the AI. And as the training systems become better, you only deploy them once your training system is hitting like a 99% accuracy rate, which is, again is very different than how the rest of the companies do AI. Are you happy with the current state of AI right now? I mean, there's so much negative stuff going on right now. It's, it, it is scary. Uh, people don't know what's gonna happen. Uh, are the robots gonna take over? <laughs> but it, do you feel happy? Are you yeah. satisfied with, with the direction that it's going? I, mean, I look at AI and I say, you know, I, I believe people are rightfully concerned, but I think we're a long way away from having robots and self-driving vehicles and self-moving anything, frankly. And, and there's really evidence to prove that, right? Like we have not seen real impact of self-driving vehicles for over a decade, and there's really nothing on the horizon. Why is it? It's not that the AI has completely failed. 
it's that most AI is very good at simple tasks. It is not so good at complex tasks. Therefore, if you're going to build very good AI for complexity, it needs to be built in a very specific way, which is a reflection of how we've done our work. But nowhere in the whole grasp of AI right now are we in a position where we're going to say, let AI make very serious decisions across you know, large uh, aspects or sectors of the economy, for example. AI has been widely used for the last 20 years in finance and in banking, and it's made, frankly, a lot of great decisions. It's helped us avoid major calamities and collapses. Imagine the ones that we've already seen. If we didn't have that type of AI, we would have been in a much worse system. So I think humans have to acknowledge that we are a species that constantly learns, and it's a species that is going to utilize this type of advancement of technology for the next revolution. It's going to not only impact us here in the U.S., but across the world. So I think people have to just kind of take a step back, you know, understand where that position is. And again, I strongly advocate regulation around uh, the development of AI so that we do it in a, in a safe and effective way. OK, so I'm getting kind of the bigger picture here that AI is very much a part of the organization, but you've got humans kind of operating at every level. Where do you see the organization in five years, 10 years? Where do you see food allergies in this country for people? I think the Food Allergy Institute is in an, an amazing position. We have our product ready, uh, 8,000 remissions. These patients are coming here from all over the world for treatment. And we have this system now ready to deploy in the concept of growth. So we have grown regionally here in the last few years, even during the pandemic. Imagine one of the greatest stressors seen in the economy. And, and this organization was able to not only keep our patients safe, but actually grow during that time. Again, none of it would be possible if we didn't have machine learning and AI systems. But when we're looking at taking this to the next level, so going from 15,000 patients to 25,000 patients to 50,000 patients, that is a major ask, a major lift of any single system. In fact, in healthcare, you don't see that goal really for anyone, but we're ready. Uh, this system, this product, product meaning the AI machine learning system, is ready to expand. It's ready to train the right individuals. It's ready to accept the patients. It's ready to go for the maximum level of approvals necessary here in the United States. So we are very excited. I think we're in a position where we can actually tackle 50 to 100,000 new patients here in the next five to 10 years minimum. And the beauty, the beauty of artificial intelligence is you can see how quickly we scaled things up in just 20 years, just from one person now to hundreds of individuals promoting and operating these systems to 15,000 patients. What if we could ex expand that to 250,000 patients or the 8 million patients who actually need that access in this country? That was my, my dream and vision many years ago, and I can't be any more excited to see where we are right now because we're ready to launch. And hopefully no mistakes like there have been no mistakes in the past. I'm very confident we will have absolutely no major mistakes. And that's all, again, due to major AI and machine learning systems operating the best way possible. Thank you, Dr. Rondawa, for your time. Thank you.